Phil, thank you again for being here and trusting me. I really appreciate that, that you take the time to, to do this interview with this all, with all these crazy things going on. But uh, listen, straight to the first question, I know you don't have a lot of time. Um, I know obviously you are the director of Next Generation Ballet. So the first question is, what is Next Generation Ballet? Okay. Next Generation Ballet is the pre-professional trainee division of our conservatory. The Strauss Performing Arts Center is the largest performing arts center south of the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC. It's an immense building. As you know, you've been there, you've taught for me. Um, and within the, all the theaters within that big performing arts center, there is a conservatory called the Patel Conservatory. The Patel family wanted to bring art to Tampa and there's music and dance and drama. And um, my good friend, Peter Stark, started Next Generation Ballet. He's now working for Boston Ballet. And he wanted a pre-professional trainee division um, so that they would have a lot of experience performing because the stress center has fantastic theater. So in addition to the training, there's the performance opportunities. And um, I took the helm in 2015 and I'm heading into my fifth year now. It's hard to believe. Um, I had a lot of different experiences coming into it. A lot of people know me from having performed at New York City Ballet. Um, I also was on the faculty of School of American Ballet and um, worked at Miami City Ballet, actually in development for many, many years. Oh, really? And, um, I became a repetitor for the Balanchine and Robbins Trust. So I was staging a lot of Jerome Robbins and George Balanchine all over, all over, and getting to know all the companies in America and all their schools. And that was really fun too, and choreographing quite a bit. And I'm sort of able to parlay all of that experience into my work with Next Generation Ballet. I really want, I find it very gratifying to help um, children, I mean, they're young adults, find their way into whatever um, company, trainee program, second company best suits them. Now, your background obviously is Balanchine. You mm -hmm. were principal dancer from uh, New York City Ballet. Is that what you're looking for in a student when they go there and audition? Do you have a uh, specific body type, a specific dancer that <laughs> what you decide to I think a lot of people might assume incorrectly when they, they know about the pedigree of the New York City Ballet that um, it's a Balanchine school exclusively. Um, of course, the legacy of Balanchine, you know, it's in my veins and it's a part of everything that I do. But, you know, I really grew up in a more Vaganova based school at the School of the Virgin Ballet, which I received the majority of my training up until I was 16. And um, those, you know, strong classical roots were there. I didn't grow up dancing Balanchine. I remember doing the Jester in Swan Lake when Nicholas Berrios came and set it and do, you know, the Court of Ballet of all those great classes. We have Fred, Freddie Franklin came and staged um, La Sulfide. And so I had all of that growing up. So to sort of do what I'm doing now with Next Generation Ballet makes sense because it's a lot of the, the pure classics that I did as a kid, and then I can bring in the elements of the Balanchine that I did, just in terms of programming, for example, in the spring, we always do a spring show. Um, one year we did Giselle, the next year I did Jerome Robbins, Circus Polka, and George Balanchine's Donizetti Variations, and then the third act of Don Q. And then we went back, and then we did Cinderella, and then the next year we did a part of Lake Corsair, and we did Balanchine's Western Symphony. So I like to think of it as the foundations of the tree and they get their foundation. And there are children that will fall in love with the balancing element of it, and I will help them go to the right place, whether that be School of American Valley, Miami City Valley, Pacific Northwest. Those are the things I think of that you know, are the most balancing affiliated places. But I have plenty of children that, that they need the influence because everyone dances balancing now, but not exclusively so. It was one of the things I was most nervous about when I took the job, because <laughs> everybody wants to know, how am I gonna turn from a straight back leg? Am I gonna you know, turn from two bent knees? And I looked at Peter Stark's curriculum and it was very clever what he said. He said 75% of the weight's gonna be over the front leg no matter what. Whether you're you know, turning from two bent knees or a straight back leg, the majority of the weight's gonna be over the supporting leg anyway. And when I go out on stage, particularly with American ballet companies, um, a majority of the ladies are doing a straight arm even if they're not having their straight leg back. So I say to my kids, there's, obviously there's not one correct way. Um, 
so I sort of base it on like with the boys. Okay. We do rounded, we do two bit knees because they're going for multiple turns mm -hmm. and that's the direction they're going. And I let Julio just do whatever Julio is going to do. Um, but if I feel someone's like on a particular um, trajectory, like I had a lovely dancer, Dominica, who grew up here and she's now at SAB. I started training her with a straight back leg and this extended arm because I knew that's where she was going to go. Or if they come to me from a Miami City Ballet or another place, I, I don't change it from them because that's what, but I don't necessarily teach that blanket. So I think that just makes me a little different from other places. I don't think one's right or one's wrong. I just think that until they're at a point in their development where they really have to lock it in. I mean, I was a principal at New York City Ballet for how long? And I didn't turn with a straight back leg until I was 18 years and old. I was going to ask you that. Yeah. And now, now um, do they, when you go, if, let's say that you are at New York City Ballet, mm -hmm. you have to actually do yes. the long legs. So there's no Cuban nope. that is right there now. No, nope. yeah. as it should be, as it should be. Those, those ballets are created with that specifically in mind. You have to spot front. You have to have the straight back leg. You're not going to do this. But that's, I don't think there's any reason why someone can't adjust as long as the fundamentals of the weight distribution and fourth is correct. I guess that's why it's kind of hard to get into mm -hmm. that. Um, very good. Uh, I'm going to ask you a very specific question about boys. Mm -hmm. Now, out of fear, a lot of boys kind of still have difficulty to tell their father they want to be a ballet dancer, still in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, in my case, I was telling Bruce Marx this, that I, when I became a ballet dancer, my father immediately thought I was going to be gay, because it's that consumption that ballet is only for girls. And I've seen how schools, like probably yours and mine, we, we struggle recruiting boys and one of the reasons is that they, they don't want to tell their, their father is any any comment you can do about that can say about that well i mean i'm honest with my students about my own struggles um i was growing up in richmond virginia at an all boys prep school mm -hmm. and i was bullied and when i say bullied i don't mean like facebook bullying i mean i was like i was afraid to walk into the school um so um it is a part of life but for dancers, it's different. Like there was no hiding from it. Ever Villela tells the hysterical stories about how he tried to hide his dancing. But well, <laughs> I was on the cover of the Richmond Times Dispatch dancing a Nutcracker in white tights. So there was no hiding it. <laughs> but what I always say to, to them is I loved dance more than any degree of bullying could stop me from doing it. Um, four o'clock came. I was in the ballet studio. And that meant more to me than any of the other bullying could add up to. We're living in a different place. Most schools have no bullying tolerance. Um, and I don't mean just ballet schools, schools, period. You can't control every element of life, but you can't, period, anyway. You can only control how you react to it. Um, we've come a long way um, with how kids, re kids, are, kids are good. Like mm -hmm. you in the hallway and you see them talk to each other. They're so sophisticated. They're so okay with everything. Um, I, I've been pleasantly surprised since I took the job and I met with, with parents and I meet them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I find their concerns are far more about um, how's my kid going to make a living? Are they going to get a job? I don't feel that as much. Maybe I'm being naive. Um, I would like to think that we're further along than that. It's probably not true of every family. Also, what I had was, and I don't know if you had this, Israel, I was like the one boy in class, you know, I didn't grow up like, you know, I talked to Julio where he had the boys class, right? I mean, for so much of my youth, there weren't enough boys to merit a boys class. And when I went to School of American Ballet in the summer, or I went to San Francisco Ballet in the summer, it was one of the first times where I was having boys class every day. So that's something that I'm offered, that I offer at Next Generation Ballet, and it is really important. It's important. Uh, for training because men's training is a little different, but it's also important because boys drive each other in a different way. They like that competition. And it's kind of like, I find boys and girls compete in different ways. The boys are all like a little more vocal and like knocking each other on the shoulder. And like, it's kind of more fun. Whereas the, the, the ladies that get more intense, you know what I mean? And they're, they're, they're they're more structured and they're more serious and the boys almost need that ribbing a little bit. 
Um, I don't mean bowling by any sense, but I just kind of meant I, I, I don't have such a closed knit, like you can't talk and don't talk and you get in like, I don't do that so much as long as it stays respectful because I feel like their energy feeds one another. And if one does like a double tour, pirouette, double tour, and they, then the next one wants to try a little bit, that's just the nature of how boys learn and get better. I agree. I, and, you know, I always tell the people that I talk to that most of my, my questions are based in my experience as a dancer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I do have friends um, that at, at some point, they were afraid to tell their parents, even adults. Yeah, and, I was. Uh, you, and and I, I think that, that we need to stop. You know, I, I think uh, if you're a boy, you want to be, a, you want to be a dancer. Who cares what people say? Just go and go to the school. Go to to his school. It's amazing. <laughs> if I, if I come come to my team. Uh, <laughs> but um, it, it's important that they know. And I'm I'm glad. Oh, I'm glad that you're saying that. Um, going to another uh, question. Besides, now you don't have a lot of time. It's okay for a parent to kind of pooch their daughter or kids to be a dancer. Sometimes I, I've heard kids saying, I actually ask them, so you're here because you want to dance? Or tell me your story. And they're like, no, my mom want me to be here, but I don't want to. <laughs> Sometimes I, think, I think what I'm finding, because I have a lot of conferences with children's and their parents and sometimes the parents want to just meet with me and sometimes they want the child there they get uh, evaluations twice a year so they the, the children and the parents always know where they stand in terms of my esti estimation of their progress um, usually you need to help children come to their own realization of what they want their future to like and what they want their goals to be. If you ask a 12 year old YGP contestant backstage, I want to be in American Ballet Theater. Like they all want to be in like, you know, they all want to be in ABT New York City Ballet. And that's, that's a great dream to have at 12, right? Like you, you dream, dream, dream. And then as you continue to train and you go to summer academies and you kind of understand what it's like to be a, a smaller fish in a bigger pond, um, you become a little bit more focused on what your, your goals to be. I think there are more options for dancers than maybe when I was younger and that like maybe you had to be employed by the time you were 18 or you weren't going to be a professional dancer. Um, the college curriculums weren't as spectacular as they are now. There weren't all these trainee divisions and second companies where you have more time to germinate and grow before you go to the company. There's just a lot, the menu's a lot bigger than it was in 1987 when I started in New York City Ballet. Um, and I find that people are, are becoming employed a little bit later because of all of that. So the structure of it all is different. Um, but typically by the time they're graduating from me, they know whether they're doing it because they were encouraged to do it or because they really want to do it. And sometimes I'll have a parent that say, well, the reasons why we started all of this have changed. You know, I wanted them, my child to be graceful and understand that, but now that they're having to choose between this and ballet and the school, I help the parents sometimes come to a decision and help them to say, it's okay. We've taken this as far as we should. We need to change course and we need to do this. And I always say to them, listen, I went to a very prestigious boarding school and my dad was like, you are gonna go get a sterling education no matter what. And fortunately at St. Paul's, I was able to balance it because the school really helped me. I was in a unique situation. Most graduates weren't going into a professional company. They were gonna to go to you know, an Ivy League college. Um, so I do feel like it's one aspect of what Next Generation does. I, I, I always say, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't see the future. And I also say, I'm one person's artistic opinion. I'm not everyone's artistic opinion, but these are my thoughts. And if you agree with me, great. And if you wanna disagree with me, be my guest. It's unbelievable you said that because uh, you just read my mind because I was gonna <laughs> ask you, uh, do you guarantee every student they, they are going to be professional? How can you guarantee? How can you, know? how can you guarantee that? Exactly. Exactly. You can't. But what you can say is do your research. You can say, know who that artistic director is. Know who that faculty is. Know what ballets they dance. Know, call your friend that's in the school. How many hours a day do they dance with the company? Do you get contemporary? Because I think that's really important. Do you, all those things... Like they have to do, the, there's enough information now online. And if you don't have it, 
Instagram your friend and ask them. Because if you have time to go on and watch YouTube, you certainly have time to do your research. I believe that we should also not only teach the technique and how to do Tempe work, but knowledge. And that's one thing I want to do. I want to bring the history. I want to bring those people who at some point, years, years ago, what they did to this, uh, to this art, you know? Yeah, I think because we know we sometimes take for granted they don't know. I remember when I first started teaching the YHP solos, and I've been associated with them for years because I used to dance at the galas when I was in New York City Ballet, and then Larissa wanted me to be a judge and a mentor and a teacher, and now all of a sudden I'm, you know, getting all my next gen students involved in it, and I forget which solo it was, maybe it was Giselle, first act, and I realized that this lovely dancer had no idea. <laughs> of where that solo fit into the first act and what you know even who like she didn't even realize that out that that who she was speaking to you know like who was on that side and who was on that side and and I thought wow they don't know context and then I realized it's a part of the bigger education we've taken a lot of advantage during this time with COVID to do a lot of education and we've done a lot of q and I've had uh, Justin Peck and Patricia Delgado on. I've had both of the Fairchild brothers and sisters, Robbie and Megan on. Um, we've done history lessons. Royal Bali has a lot of great stuff online. Um, acting lessons. We've just, we've just been taking advantage of doing the things that you never have time to do when you're putting on a show or you're getting ready for YGP or Nutcracker. So that's been good. And I think um, I'll start talking historically and I'll look in their eyes in the Zoom and I'm like, ooh, they don't really know what I'm talking about. Let me back up. Okay, let me start from the beginning. <laughs> and then, like, I start to talk it all through. Um, and it's, in some ways I feel like it's not their fault. There's a lot of information that's not available historically because it wasn't filmed. Okay. You know, like New York City Ballet is a big part of it. They're, this is the first time New York City Ballet has ever done digital programming because Balanch, you can't go on YouTube, you're not going to see a lot of Balanchine Ballet. You know, we would film a live from Lincoln Center once every 10 years. So people say, oh, can I see a video of you dancing? I'm like, no, because there's like two little times I was ever filmed because we just, you know, we just didn't do it all that much. So you have to think about what's available to them. I agree. I agree. Now I'm going to ask you two questions and try to make it short. Mm -hmm. uh, what make a teacher a great teacher? And what make a dancer a great dancer? Okay, a teacher has to be selfless. A lot of teachers are former dancers that retired and you have to have finished that and closed that book so that you can be on the other side of it and be completely selfless in giving to your student. Um, you have fond memories of your performing time and that's great, but you're on the other side now. And you have to have not only the knowledge, but you have, have to have a great deal of patience and compassion and empathy for them because you're, you're raising children. You are not just teaching them steps. You're trying to give them survival tools. Um, and I don't think you can compartmentalize and say, I'm gonna teach a 15 year old that way and a 10 year old that way. It, for me, it doesn't work that way. There you go, sorry, somebody was calling me. Yeah, I me too, you know, so, everyone, my family. Um, okay, so, and then, so you asked, the other question you asked me was what makes a great dancer? I haven't thought about that in a while. Um, obviously great technique, but the memorable dancers are the ones that are able to maintain their health and their technique for long periods of time, so they make a really long lasting impact. Like I was really proud of the fact that I danced until I was 42, hard ballets too. It's mastering your technique when you're young and then finding how you want to present yourself on stage. That's great. Uh, you said something about um, being healthy. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that was not going to be uh, the question at this point, but now we spoke about that. Do you have an advice for, you know, and dancers in general, for them to have a longer career? I think when we were younger, um, just go take an extra class was sort of our version of how to be a better dancer. Okay, well, I'll just stack five classes on top of each other and that will make me a better dancer. I think time is better spent, um, even if you only have one technique class a day instead of two, um, do it to the best of your ability, but there's other things like now we understand the importance of cross-training. 
whether it's, um, we also understand the importance of stretching in parallel and not always turned out. We now understand the importance of like, um, just being psychologically fit, whether that's going to, you know, a, a sports trainer and doing cross training or whether it's going speaking to somebody about nutrition or there's just so much more that schools provide now than they, they did before in terms of general wellness. I think it's very important um, injury prevention and that's some through technique and it's some through a physical therapist. Um, but I always say, if you're going to be injured, the best thing you can do is come back a better dancer having learned something from it. It's not just, oh, here's a roadblock and I'm out for six months. And you have to, for me, it was discovering gyrotonics or, you know, Pilates or doing the things that I could do and I come back, but then that made me better. Um, Were you ever injured in your career? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was. I had big injuries. I never had like small injuries. <laughs> you know, for me, and, how do you get back? How do you, do you take, it, take it seriously? Because a lot of kids doesn't take it sometimes seriously. Um, yeah, those injuries that you can sort of work through and you need to as part of the company. But I, I ended up having a foot injury that went undiagnosed for a long time and danced on it and danced on it. And like nothing was showing up. I was getting MRIs. I was getting x-rays. It just wasn't showing up. It was just a really big bone chip that was sitting at a weird angle. And then I think people started to think, well, maybe it's on his head. It was really, it was very upsetting. Um, and then I had a little tear in my cartilage and it got to the point right through my foot and my knee. I was just, you know, and I was just becoming a principal and it was, it was very challenging. And then finally they found it in a, in an MRI and I was spending my own money flying all over America trying to find out what it was. It was very frustrating. And then I had two surgeries and I came back and I don't think I missed a performance for like, I'm not kidding, like four, four years. I became... <laughs> Uh, a friend in the company uh, called me Backbone. He's like, hey, Backbone. I'm like, why do you call me Backbone? He says, because you are running up and down the stairs dancing for everybody. And you went from being out for like, I'm not kidding. It was like eight months, nine months um, to like not missing a show for four years. And then I had another knee injury. But my knee injury, you know, all my injuries were accumulative. They weren't like, bang, I came down and I'm, I'm hurt, you know, on crutches. They were, they were accumulative injuries, which sometimes are harder to diagnose how, why, why you stop dancing? It was just a decision? I was 42. <laughs> <laughs> I was 42. I was teaching in the school. Um, I was thinking about pulling it out another year because I had a lot of parts that, you know, I could partner and maybe not be as, but um, my husband and I were thinking about moving to Florida, uh, which we did. I retired. He had already started his job in Florida. I retired and four days later, I was on a plane and have, have, had left New York. Um, you know, I do it. I do it all the way. Um, I think it's a very personal decision about when is the right time to retire. I knew that when I retired, I wanted people to go, oh, he still looks good. Or like, oh, he's doing all right. You know, he's getting by. And um, maybe that's a little bit of self-protective vanity. Um, it's, it's, and I had, a lot of my friends had been retiring, you know, so it wasn't like it wasn't on my mind. I had watched Peter Ball and Nikolai and Damian retire, and I had actually retired a lot of ballerinas into their final performance, like Kira Nichols. So I was very aware of it. Um, I think it just worked cohesively with a life decision to move to Florida. And then it wasn't easy to leave New York because I just, I worked so hard to get there. And I just thought that would be my life forever. But I feel very blessed in that I can live, I can live here, um, do what I do for this place. And uh, I still have my, my, my toe in it because um, like I'm teaching tomorrow for New York City Valley. I'm going to teach them virtually on Fridays. And I stage a lot of Balanchine and Robin. So I feel like I kind of have the best of everything going for me right now. That's great. That's great because um, I'm, I'm, I'm the one that always people ask, you know, when, when do you stop dancing? When do you stop dancing? And, and they ask me also, when is the best time for a dancer to stop? You know, and uh, one of the interviews that I have, um, Rasta Thomas, he mm -hmm. says, you, you know, if anything is hurting, go for it. <laughs> but mm -hmm. sometimes it's also how, how honest you are with yourself, like to mm -hmm. yourself and to the audience. If you don't look good and you don't dance any, as good as before, you better stop, you know. So I think it's easier to dance longer when you're part of a company that takes such good care of you like New York City Ballet. I, the majority of my performing was there because our seasons were so long, right? And um, I wasn't a freelance artist dancing in a different place on a different stage in a different rep and not knowing what my conditions were. 
I think that's much, much harder. When you look at some of the dancers in New York City Ballet, Kira Dance I think she was 47, Wendy too. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's unique and that's amazing, but you know, it is part of being part of a big organization where you have excellent health care. You're tending to do all your performances on that one stage. So circumstances can be different for everybody. No, but and, at um, the same time, I feel... Um, I'm just really grateful that they took such good care of me. Sorry. sorry this is just, I need to keep uh, an eye on the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the, um, but also, I've seen a lot of, uh, I think maybe including myself, but um, a lot of dancers, principal dancers who are still dancing pretty good, and because mm -hmm. they have a certain age, mm -hmm. they have been asked to retire. And then they go out there, and then the first thing you see on the newspaper is, I didn't want to go, but I was <laughs> asked. But then I'm retired, but I'm still... Um, yeah, I think, I think it depends on what your company system is. I think there are a lot of people um, in sort of European companies where it might be like government will require that you retire at a certain age. Um, and I don't know if those changes have been made. Um, I can only speak from experience, you know, it's like a writer knows what they write, what they know. Um, I feel like the history of New York City Ballet, they're, they're very generous. Um, some people need to be helped to that decision. <laughs> so it's part of the conversation. Um, but that's a luxury that they might afford that maybe a smaller company on a smaller budget can't. Um, I, think, I think directors can be very helpful because it harkens back to what we talked about before with students. Uh, they can be very helpful in holding a mirror up to a situation and helping that person look at the reality of the situation. Um, so that's, that's sort of, I think, the responsibility of the leadership. I believe so. That I believe so, Phil, but sometimes it, it can be even personal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah but, you know what, but you know what I say, Israel, to that? I, I say to students, um, you can love a company, but, but, but most important, go where you're going to be appreciated. You might be a great dancer and you're going to go to there and that, that director, they just, you're not their thing. You're not their taste. They don't like you. You're going to know in a year or two, whether they use you or not. And it's okay to say, thank you very much. Say it very respectfully. And you move on because you can't force someone to love you. And it's their prerogative to choose to cast you or not. And it might be, they don't like your dancing. It might be, they find you're difficult to work with. They might find, oh, well, that person's injury prone, whether it's true or not, that's in their mind. So you have to take the responsibility as a dancer to decide, am I going to stay there or am I going to move on? There's nothing wrong with moving on if it's need to be. Perfect. Uh, I, I want to ask you a question before I forget. Um, okay. I asked you this question before. Education versus career. Should a student go to college before they become professional or a dancer? This question is a lot easier to answer than it was even five years ago. I think many people, maybe my generation, thought, oh, I'm going to college because I'm not going to get a job, but I can keep dancing. Um, I think that also might have been a perception because you didn't have a lot of dancers land at these colleges and like offer like top tier. And I think I'm speaking more specifically ballet. I think there's always been good training in colleges, but maybe like specifically ballet that was very limited. Um, I think to Indiana University where you have Kira Nichols and Carla Corbs and Michael Vernon and so many, Sean Stevens, a lot of wonderful people teaching there. I'm thinking of what Jody Gates is doing at USC. You know, Butler's always had a lot of good people. Juilliard's always had a lot of good people. I just think that there's a lot more selection. And very often with boys, if they started late, they need a couple more years of training really behind them and they can go to college and they can get to education. So sometimes it's college education to continue more years. They might be a really good technical dancer, but they don't really have the emotional maturity and they need that. It might be a dancer that I love everything I've done. It's given me all of my discipline but I probably need to go and study communications because what I'm really going to need to do is take all that wonderful dance experience, but go towards another way. There's lots of paths, but the good news is there's so much good training and that stigma of I need to go to college because I'm not going to get hired is not necessarily true. And I think, and I was just talking about this to a student the other day in all honesty, 
directors are hiring older people now. They're, I'm used to people getting hired at 17 and 18. What I'm seeing now is people getting hired at 20 and 21 instead of 17, 18. Um, I think they want a more mature person who is literally physically finished growing. I started growing when I was 16, 17. So it makes perfect sense that I didn't get hired until I was 19 because even then I still looked like this and had to go weight train. Um, so their odds of getting injured are less. They're more emotionally capable. Um, they have more time to refine their technique. So when I go and I stage some things, I'll say, oh, you're a lovely dancer. Where did you come from? Oh, well, you might have seen me here, but I actually went to any university and, and here I am. Or, so I really think that it is a logical evolution um, for some people. And it's not for others. Some people need to go into the training company and then that. It's, I really do that individually. I sit down and do it individually. That's, I, I do have, we do have girls here that they struggle a little bit uh, with the decision whether they want mm -hmm. to go to college or, or continue uh, mm -hmm. dancing. Two more questions on this, very quickly. Okay. Uh, you and I, we have brought students to competition to Youth America Grand Prix. Do you think it's that important for a dancer to go to competition? I think the process of preparing for a competition is very important. And I think that visibility is very important. And let's bear in mind, yes, I, stu I prepare students for competitions, but I'm also judging. And while I'm judging, <laughs> I'm recruiting. <laughs> I'll be honest, I'm recruiting for Next Generation Ballet. And what I'm looking for is potential more than a finished product. Um, I think I've told you before, I, um, I competed in Prix de Lausanne when I was 16. And... Um, the only reason I did as well as I did was because of they saw potential. I mean, they literally told me as much. I won my silver medal and I felt all good about myself, but they're like, yes, but you won this because of the potential. You've got so much work to do. And I mean, I was just a mess. I, like, I would hit one pirouette and then fall out of the next, um, which is what you should be doing at 16 probably. Um, but yes, I do think it's really important. I, I, I really like working with YGP in tandem with doing my Nutcracker because they're working on the court of ballet work and, and they're not cracker, but they're also getting a chance to prepare a solo for, for YGP. And um, sometimes I will get um, kids that pass to New York finals and the parents will even say to me, but should, should we go to finals? And I'm like, yes, because there's the educational arm of competitions now where they're having all these master classes and they're going to see other, especially the boys, they're going to see other boys their age, they're going to be exposed. And then, you know, I think of someone like that Ann Sisk, who was just sort of looked at from year after year through YAGP, you know, and Adam Sklut watching her going, wow, I really like that one. I like her more. You know, like she was laying the groundwork to be recruited in the end. So I think it's good if the teachers don't put a lot of pressure on the students, like you got to win to prove that my school's worthy. I would never do that. Um, I'm not going to lie, I enjoy it when they do well, but I, um, I enjoy it more for the benefit of them feeling confident. And I say, I always get the parents and I sit down, I'm like, listen, I'm the worst at guessing who's going to win. I'm so bad. I sit out there and Yvonne's much better at it than I am. <laughs> um, but but you, you're, you're not going to know. And, and, and in the end, you ask a principled answer that might have, might have been a Grand Prix winner. And they cannot get a job sometimes. <laughs> they can't get a job sometimes. It's, so I do think it's important. I personally like it. Um, but I think it's how it's presented as the opportunity by the school and the teacher. Phil, I'm going to give you three words. A student is going to train with you in your school. What do you expect from them? Potential. Discipline. And persistence. I'll give you one more. Musical. A lot of students, they don't know how to count. <laughs> that's, that's our, I, think, I think that's really sort of our biggest obstacle today. Because what won me over to, to, to SAB and New York City Valley and that whole path? Because it, it could have easily gone the other way. I remember Stanley Williams taking me aside and saying, do you want to be in American Valley Theater or do you want to be in New York City Valley? Like, what do you, what do you really, you want? It was musicality. It was hearing music presented in such a way that I felt like dance was a physical manifestation of music. And I haven't studied music, but I've always been told I was musical. I remember when Georgina Parkinson came to Richmond Valley and I was 12 years old, 
13 years old. She stopped the whole master class and was like, you little boy, do that combination. And she didn't tell me why. And I was so nervous and I did it. It was a Guanga Allegro. And she's like, he did it more musically than anybody in the room. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> that was, that was, you know, and, I'm, and I say Georgina Parkinson because everyone thinks, oh, Balanchine, Balanchine, Balanchine. is like, you know, that's, that's a different um, training ground. I just love it when I can sit back and not be nervous and be looking at a gymnastics routine, but I just see someone dancing beautifully to the music and it just emanates out of every pore. And it's, that to me is really good training. And, and, and that's very important because one of the things that we like, and I, I, I know you also do that, you, you teach also that, trying to be, uh, you know, music, feeling the music in because sometimes um, they might get lost just mm -hmm. thinking on the step and thinking on this. And, and I think that's very important. Philip, I know you have to go. Yes. Otherwise, time to we... zoom again. <laughs> <laughs> time to <laughs> zoom again. I do appreciate one more time. I know. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. No, I'm... and I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you for getting all these guests and doing it because I think there's an appetite and a need for it. So I'm, thank you. I'm you. learning. I'm learning as I go. But thank you one more time. You have okay. a great day and stay all safe. Right. Right. Would you like to see more interview like this? Please consider subscribing and do not forget to click the notification button. I have a few people asking me why they cannot see my uploads right away. And I promise you it's probably because they are not clicking the notification button. While you do that, thank you so much. Be blessed, be safe, and I'll see you in the next video.